You're listening to Making a Living Show. I'm Roby Levy. Hi, this is David Pasquese, and I make insert nouns here for a living. David Pasquese is an actor and improviser known for hits like Strangers with Candy, Curb Your Enthusiasm, Veep, and At Home with Amy Sedaris. He's an accomplished writer, veteran of I.O. and Second City, and is considered by the finest improvisers on the planet to be the finest improviser on the planet. Here's my chat with David Pasquese. Who are you and what do you make for a living? My name's David Pasquese and um, what do I make for a living? Uh, I told you it was challenging. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, boy, I don't know that I, uh, unfortunately, I don't make anything. I uh, provide some services. What services uh, do you provide for a living? Um, I'm changing the show title. I'm an actor for hire. Um, I'm not a writer for hire, though I do write things. Um, and I uh, do what is required to make the things I want to make. Sometimes that's producing, sometimes writing, sometimes uh, it's uh, whatever's, whatever it takes. Well, that makes sense. Well, let's get into this then. How did you get started acting and then doing the things that you need to do to get the things you want to do made? I started out through um, improvisation, actually. Um, when I was in college, I'd never been on stage before or anything. And I was almost finished with college. I had went with my brother to an improv class in Chicago and I really enjoyed it. I went through a series of workshops there, um, finished those up while I was finishing my undergrad and that was it. And that's all I thought I was ever going to do with that. Um, I, in the meantime, I met a guy when I went to school, uh, over in Italy and that was Joel Murray, and he and I, when we got back, we continued to look into improvisation. I graduated from college, and then we started uh, with Del Close and uh, started improvising more seriously, I guess, or more, more, just started improvising more. And through that, I started doing stand-up comedy so that I could get more comfortable on stage as an improviser. So that's my route. I came in through performing. And then once you're doing that, you try to pick up other, other work because the, I mean, though improvisation is a cash cow, <laughs> um, there are sometimes, uh, that's where I made my money. My true love is delivering ribs, um, which I, that's my passion. I just, I supplemented delivering ribs with, Stand. Um, and so you pick up different jobs. There was basically one paying job for someone with the kind of experience that I had in Chicago, and that was Second City. And there's no payment for improvisation. Everybody has a sketch group, but you split the door there. So there's not really much in the way of income doing that. But Second City had basically the only paying gig in town for someone like me and Joel. And um, we both ended up getting hired there. In the meantime, I was doing uh, waiting tables and picking up whatever work I had to. It was not expensive to live in Chicago at that time. I think it's still pretty reasonable. You don't have to work several jobs in order to ha pay rent. And you can really kind of uh, Blanche Dubois and, uh, you know, depend upon the kindness of strangers. It's 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 pretty great. Still a pretty great community in Chicago. Um, so then I started at Second City, and from there started. After I started working there, I started doing commercial work. Actually, while I was working there, and, and even before, when you're an actor in Chicago, you can go to a bunch of different agents, agencies, or you used to be able to. I don't know what it's like now because it was a long time ago. But you used to go and uh, list at a bunch of different talent agencies and. Um, that you were called multiple listed as opposed to well, what's the term for exclusive when you're just have one. And, um, but at first you're with everybody and they, if, if they look at your headshot and if they, whoever submits you first, that's who your agent is for that particular project. Started getting a little bit of work and I started doing okay at second city. We moved up to the main stage and then you get in basically back then you, you had to be working pretty consistently in order to get a, a, an exclusive agent in Chicago. 
And so when I got to Second City, I, uh, I got signed with the Gettys Agency and Paula Music was my agent at that time. And today my agent is Paula Music. Oh, wow. All this time? Same, same person. On and, on, on and off. She was a manager for a while when, and she was then my manager. And now she's back to being an agent. She's my agent. Almost the whole time I've been with her. You don't really hear about that kind of uh, loyalty uh, necessarily in the entertainment industry. She's pretty great. So I want to roll all the way back for a second. When you and Joel were in Second City, mm-hmm. this is when you were with Del Close? Uh, actually, yes. He direct- So we started with Del before that when he was coming up with the Herald. And that's what I want to talk about. Like, tell, okay. tell me about the Herald because I don't think people know what, what this is. Because, Well, I'm going to let you tell it because you're okay. a better storyteller so Del- than I am. Del Close was a, uh, an actor at the Second City and a director at the Second City for a very long time. He had a, uh, behavioral problems because of substances, and so they let him go. He kind of had a hard time for quite a while. But by the time Joel and I got him, he was with Sharna Halpern, and they had started working together. And um, they started developing this long form of improvis- group improvisation called The Herald as a performance piece. Up until that time, uh, long form improvisation was used to develop material that then would be scripted. And so the scripted material is the finished product. I thought it could be good enough, consistently enough, that the improvisation itself would be the show. And so that was his belief. And we happened to be there at that time that he was coming up with it. And he wasn't coming up with it for the first time right then. They had done it at the committee back in the 60s. But as a, an evening's entertainment by itself, this was the first time. And also kind of codify a structure for it. And so we just happened to be there. And so we try stuff. It didn't work. We try other stuff. It worked better. And, and then we started doing it in front of people. And so that was v- exciting for all of us. We, no one knew what we were doing. And we couldn't point to anything and say, oh, that's what we're trying to do because no one was doing it. So it was all pretty fun. And then a lot of us got hired at Second City. And when Joel and I made it down to main stage, we worked in the touring company for a while and opened the theater out by the airport, you know, a, a satellite theater for the downtown theaters. And then when we got downtown, the director of for the entire time of Second City, the creative uh, artistic director, Bernie Salins, stepped down and there was a need for a director. And Joel and I went into Joyce Sloan, the producer, and, and said, well, how about bringing Dell back? He's, you know, and so he did. He came back and he, he brought in some other people that he'd already worked with. Um, and some, some people left on their own. And uh, so our cast was Judith Scott, Holly Wartell, Joe Liss, Tim Meadows, Chris Farley, Joel Murray, and me. That was our cast and Ruby Streak on piano. And it was pretty, pretty fun. And so he directed that show. And the first time he directed at Second City for quite, for, I don't know, 20 years or something. Like that. And with the Herald, for the audience that doesn't know what this is, at least this is my understanding of it, is that it, it, the idea is it's long form and it's, and it's, there are characters established at various points or introduced at various points. And rather than just being one off sketches and then they're gone, they kind of, they come back, they recur, they, and, and, and the, the different scenes kind of fold into each other and resolve together at the end, right? Kind of like, like a traditional play, but an improv way of getting there. Right. And at first there's a, there's a topic that's received from the audience and then that's explored for a little bit with the group. And the notion of the Herald is that the, the, the group is greater than the sum of the parts. And so we're all contributing into this thing. That's going to be better than the, the mathematical, some of our individual contributions and when it works well it that's actually true and i yes there things are scenes are established and then they return at different points in time of that scene it could be before we last saw them or sometime after we last saw them and yes uh, characters from other scenes often show up in and it doesn't always resolve neatly but um it's starting to tend Toward a resolution. And I have to ask this just because I'm actually curious. I've been around sketch a lot. I've been around stand up a lot. Is improv always comedy? Like, does it no. always have to be funny? No, there was a group, uh, uh, Mike Shannon, Paul Dillon, 
uh, Tracy Letts, among others, had a, a group called Bang Bang, and they improvised non-comedically. I, I never saw them. I, was, I happened to be on stage at Second City at the time, so I was not available to go see them. But um, they were doing crazy shit that was not comedy. And uh, I do, or for a long time, I did a show with uh, T.J. Jagodowski. And it often was funny, but that was not our goal. I mean, um, I, I think also with long, the longer stuff, it's not as comedy-focused. We're really trying, because we don't know what's going on, and you can't sustain jokes for an hour. You, can, um, you just can't play that that long and have it be, remain interesting. Um, so the shorter form stuff tends to, tends to be funnier because that's, that's really the job. Um, and the longer stuff is not, or I don't know, it's funny also, but no, it, in the answer, short answer, is, <laughs> is improvisation always comedy? No, I don't believe so. Well, and, and, and your show with TJ, you guys have been running that for some time now. How long has that been going on? We started probably about 20 years ago, but um, we haven't done it much in the last couple of years. We haven't done it as much in the last couple of years. Just because you're busy, you're different different places, that kind of thing? Yeah, yeah. But for 15 years, we did it every week. Right, and this was in Chicago and also with, with like stops in New York? Is that kind of the... Chicago and New York, yeah. For one year, we went every weekend and did four shows in New York every month. Not every weekend. Every month we do. And then after that, we'd go a few four or five times a year and do that in New York as well as our show in Chicago. And then we also traveled. We did show, we went to Europe. We did a little European tour of uh, Denmark, London, Vienna, and Rome. How did that go in the places where English is not necessarily first language and you know, your audience may have varying degrees of understanding. How did that kind of play out? You mean London? Yeah. London's a very, very confusing place. Um, it went well, Copenhagen, they, speak English better than we do. Um, <laughs> so that was really not a problem. In Rome, it was a little bit more because the particular show we did was super like, it just happened to be prototypical American. And it's just, it just did not, did not relate all that much. It's not, that's not on them or their ability to understand the language. Um, and then in Vienna, the one was, um, there, there was mostly expats. And the people that come are just, I mean, it, we also were doing workshops and just people are pretty great. And that was a crazy thing. So we were doing the Herald in this room in Chicago, however many years ago, in 85, I think it probably was, something like that. And no one in the world, you know, there was honestly 50 people on the planet that had ever heard of what a Herald is. No exaggeration. We go to, on this tour and these people are from, Russia and Slovenia and Germany and uh, from all over. Everybody knows what a Herald is. It was the craziest thing. I'm like, well, this is all impossible. Well, now you and TJ are basically considered to be the premier heralders. That's not a word. Well, no, because we're not doing a Herald. Oh, you're not? No, we're just doing this two-person improvisation, which is basically one long, kind of one long. Somebody described it. Uh, the guy who, um, Scott Morphy, who, who produced us in New York, he described them as like these mini play, insta plays or whatever. They, they do feel more like a, like a play than a sketch. And is that different every night? And when you are doing it, it it's, it's, it, the audience shoots something out at you. And no, we don't take a right. suggestion. We just start. Um, and it is, we're not, we have nothing planned. Talk to me about inspiration here because to go out every week and just lights up and you're off and running. <laughs> Where are you coming up with these ideas? What happens if no idea comes? So we look at it a little differently, I think, than at improvisation is we look at it a little differently than maybe most folks do. A lot of times when improvising, someone might think, what can I make this into? And we honestly kind of look at it, what is this already? And so the lights come up and I, I, I look at TJ, the way he's standing, um, the look on his face. Maybe I had just moved or something, but taking all that into account, what's the most likely thing that this, this doesn't seem like he's a threat to me right now. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, but doesn't seem like he knows me. 
So maybe we're just amiable strangers. We've run it. Maybe we've seen each other. So that's basically the general idea of this relationship. I'll continue on behaving that way. And it all happens pretty quickly. But And we do this, all of us, in daily life. We, we do that exact same assessment every time we walk down the sidewalk. Is this a danger? No. And so then it kind of gels over the first 10 or 15 minutes of the show. We still might not know. <laughs> um, and so we just keep trying to figure out what this is already, not trying to turn it into something else. Have you ever gotten through a show and gone, man, that was, that was 60 minutes and I still don't know what the hell we were doing up there. Or does one of you just pull a rabbit out of a hat and at one point, just kind of throw the gauntlet down and say, this is effectively what we're doing. This is where I'm at. Does it become clear? It just kind of, it, it's like the um, a muddy waters and then all of a sudden it kind of clears up. It's like, oh, and that's what we've been doing. Oh, right. That's what we've been doing all along. And sometimes it happens quicker than other times for sure. But, um, and yes, a- absolutely. We've gone through uh, entire shows and then at the end it's was like, was, was that what we were? I don't you know, like, <laughs> But have a little powwow afterwards and go, I, I, I was doing a magic trick and you were ice skating. Uh, we never quite <laughs> found each other. Well, also, that's what we find. If we're not, if we're uh, off at the very beginning, we will never catch up. <laughs> so that's, we really pay super close attention to one another. Does that wind up netting out some really funny stuff or does that wind up just kind of, can it drag the show? Like what, what, what happens when you guys miss each other? Oh, um, oh no, it's unpleasant for everyone. <laughs> it's uninteresting for the audience and unpleasant for us. No, I I've noticed in, in a lot of your performance, you kind of revel in the uncomfortable stuff. Yeah. I mean, that's one of the things is like, is to, that's one of our goals of our show. Like a lot of shows, it's like, we're supposed to be funny. Let's go. You know, that's what they're expecting. For us, it's just, we are attempting to be to respond honestly in this moment, no plans of the future, no, no plot, but respond honestly in this moment, given what we know up until this point. And sometimes that's, I don't know how to move forward. So we're going to hang out here (laughs) and yeah, this is really fucking awkward, (laughs) but we're just going to hang out here and see, you know, see how this goes. Tell me about graveyard. I mean, this is the most uncomfortable I can imagine being it's the two of you just looking at each other spewing shit here. Yeah. Uh, the graveyard show is, uh, uh, these, t- I play a security guard. Chris Stolte plays the janitor and we're on the graveyard shift at an office tower. That's empty. And it's over the overnight shift. And they, they have to be with each other. They're the only company either one has. They're not necessarily enemies or friends. Um, they're just kind of dependent upon one another. Um, and so it's this series of sketches that all take place in this same office tower. Uh, and, and, and also one of the ideas is the, these, it's different in the middle of the night. You think of different things. I've had, I worked an overnight, uh, desk job at a hotel and you're by yourself. And the guy who's closing up the restaurant comes up and you don't like him, but <laughs> <laughs> somebody to talk to and um i'm gonna piss him off and that'll give me some fun for a little while and so it's <laughs> it's that and the the spending that much time alone you do think differently and so the topics that we discuss are maybe not things that daytime people would spend a lot of time on. that's one of those sh- i'm sorry that's one of the it's a web series and that's one of those things that the three of us ron lazaretti who uh, directed it and chris and i um, it was, I think, Ron's idea, and he approached us. With, Let's do something we want to do. Something we want to do, we want to see, and that's exactly that's all it is. You like to do things you want to see. That seems to be what see, guides you. What is it about that kind of uncomfortable, strange world that just kind of intrigues you and makes you go, "Yeah"? I think a lot of people, for example, would say, "Oh, yeah, that's a, that, that, that's a funny gag. Like, wouldn't it be funny? You know, these two guys and they're just stuck, you know, looking at each other and, and talking shit." And instead, you've gone on for three seasons finding these weird moments, these weird nighttime thoughts, these weird not friends, not enemies moments to, to capture and explore. And they're not always fun. Oftentimes, they're just, they're just plain weird. Thank you. Yeah. 
Uh, I remember, well, yeah, one of the best compliments I ever got. Trippy. That was trippy. That's like, <laughs> oh, man, that's my work is done. Um, one of the other things that I, I like working with the people I like. So the, a lot of times these projects are just excuses to spend time with people I really enjoy spending time with. Because I feel guilty about just hanging on, hanging out and drinking coffee and, you know, doing nothing. So if we say we're working on something, it's <laughs> basically, we'd have those same conversations. Yeah. Um, it's just one time we're writing them down. One time we're just drinking coffee and not writing them down. When you're doing a series like that, is that something that you're improvising and then writing? I mean, kind of like you're saying, or is that actually improv? Hit the cameras and let no, it go? No, those... Though the graveyard show is not improvised at all because we were shooting each one of those seasons is only one overnight at the, at the place. We just didn't have enough time to do a bunch of takes. So we wrote them. We each wrote separate ones. We didn't write them as a group. And, but we all kind of have a, it's hard to pick out who, if I know, I know the ones I wrote, but I'm not sure of which ones the other two guys wrote. And I think we all feel the same way there. We kind of, even that way and um and so we have we go through we shoot like 50 pages in a night so we didn't have a lot of time to improvise so those were all written down uh, and then the distant learners is a we there's a there's a little bit of improvisation within that one but also those were those are scripts now is that something that that started just COVID hit and you're like, you know, this is an idea. I want to spend time with my buddies and this is how we're going to do it and, and make good on doing some work as well. Yeah. COVID hit. And, uh, the other two guys that, uh, came up with it with me, uh, it was Brad Riddell's idea, Brad and Sandy. And they are, uh, Brad is a, uh, teacher, uh, professor at, um, DePaul, uh, film school. So he, this is actually what happened to him. And he had to go online, you know, do all his classes online. And, and um, uh, so that's, that's how that came to be. And I enjoy those guys. We shot a, a feature last summer and I've worked for Brad also before that. Tim Kazarinski, Emma Pope, uh, they're, they're just great. And uh, some of those other folks, um, uh, Gino and Audrey uh, and Wendy, I think were all in later days, this, the feature that Brad and Sandy shot last summer. Um, and all the other people too, Jason Boggs too. That's really fun. Did did people kind of come with their own characters in mind kind of thing? Cause you've got a rather large cast and you know, the, the, the screen does split up. I mean, it, it, it's gotta be quite a dance to actually get it to all work in concert, but did everybody kind of have a sense of their characters? Yes, we had, I mean, uh, we had functions that we needed, but everyone, everyone participated in the, uh, creation of their own characters. Some of them, some of them, we needed them. We gave them, you know, we want this person to be able to do that, to serve that function. But some of them just came in and did it all on their own. They were great. That's a great gang too, man. That's a real, and, and not just, uh, part of that was let's do something because this is going to last for a while and we'll go fucking bat shit crazy. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, all of us kind of looked at it the same way. Oh, good. This is something. Looking forward to something to do. Yeah, don't leave a bunch of comedians with nothing to do. It's a problem. <laughs> I mean, that's the thing. I didn't get into improvisation specifically to sit by myself. I mean, I, one of the great things about it is the feeling of community, and just hanging out and fucking off with people. I love doing that. Being with people and just fucking off. Tell me about being on these on on bigger sets because you've done a lot of TV work, a lot of film work, a lot of really recognizable stuff between uh, Veep and and Strangers with Candy and uh, you know, I mean you're you're on uh, at home uh, with Amy Sedaris right now. Um, you're the knife guy. Uh, <laughs> I keep I keep on right now. I'm doing the stabbing motion. People, go look That's it up. What it's, it's worth. Punyalata means the guy's last name. <laughs> <laughs> the stabber. The stabber. Yeah. yeah. Like what's it like to be on those kind of sets as somebody who's really a, a, an improviser, somebody who likes to shoot the shit and go back and forth. What's it like to be in such a structured environment? I'm sorry. Are you talking about Amy Sedaris being, having <laughs> anything to do with structure? Um, I've got no, to assume it, there's some structure to that set. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> They're right there. And, and that's it. There's, there's, it, you know, I do, I've done, uh, plays as well. And you just go in, you know, I don't expect go into a play 
and improvise. Right. You know, um, it depends on what the job is. And sometimes they want you to be loose with the, the words on the page. Sometimes they don't. And that's entirely up to them. And so you just figure out what the job is. Just figure out what the job is. The strange thing is, I, always, I think this is an odd observation, that when you're performing scripted material well, it's a compliment for someone to say, oh, it looked like you were making it up. And when you're improvising really well, they, it, it's a compliment for someone to say, I could swear it was written. So with your work, I mean, whether you're on stage, whether you're improvising, whether you're in a serious play, whether you're in a, a you know, you're stabbing people as, as, as the knife guy or the meat guy, what are you hoping to achieve? Like what's, what's the pinnacle? I mean, you, you've been at this for a while, you've been successful so far and hopefully more in the future, but what are you hoping to, to get out there and to convey? Well, uh, I think just to have, to, uh, to each time do something that I, uh, I, I guess the goal is to not each time, one time to look at something and say, yep, I did that all right. <laughs> do you not feel like you've done that at this point? Oh, fuck no. Never. No. As a whole, nope. I mean, and even, you know, there's this play, um, it's a short play, it's Glengarry Glen Ross, and we mm-hmm. did it. We, it was a fucking fantastic production. And a great theater, an amazing cast, great director. All of it was fantastic. And everybody was really good, except the present company excluded, um, and really interested in doing it correctly. N- nobody ever did it. We never did it right. You know, ne- not, it, you can't. You cannot. Um, I don't think so. I think there's always something that you could. So, um, the goal is to have this for, for me, it's like, you look back and like, holy shit, I've been, uh, I've been doing stuff. That's all <laughs> I've been doing stuff. Doing stuff is good. It's better than not doing stuff. Yeah. Right. Way better. Yeah. I don't think I'm going to be, um, and, uh, a wonderkind. Uh, <laughs> I don't think I'm going to make a fantastic movie at 21. That's I'm pretty sure that's not going to happen. <laughs> You've given up on being a millionaire by 30. And well, also, but like, like I think Orson Welles' uh, schedule is not my schedule. <laughs> right. Or mine. Ah, screw that guy. So how is your world organized? Who's, who's working with you on this stuff? I know you and TJ work on your show. Like you said, you've taken a bit of a break on that, but, but who's your team behind the scenes? Do you have, you, you have your manager you had mentioned. I have this a is... manager and an agent. My agent has been either my agent or manager since, uh, 1989 maybe um in large part most of the time that's paul music i currently have a manager uh stacy abrams who's great and they try to get me in on stuff um and then also some some things come in from just people i've worked with people i know people i've known so what what is it like to work with a, a manager and an agent i think a lot of people don't even know what the difference between a manager and an agent are yeah. Um, I'm not even uh, sure I do. Do you? <laughs> right. Y- yeah. Um, well, and it's changed and all of it's changed since when I first started. And my situation is a little different because I don't live in Los Angeles or New York. And so most of the talent agencies that uh, have some juice are either in New York or Los Angeles or both. In my case, the, my agency is uh, innovative and they are in Los Angeles and New York. And so wherever, whatever city I, they, I can go to either place. And, um, but those agencies are big and they have a lot of people on their rosters. And I'm not there. I don't live there. And it's more difficult for them to figure out how I'm going to do an audition than it is for someone living in Los Angeles to do an audition. They tell, they call up that person. They say, uh, be here at two o'clock. And that person is going to be there at two o'clock with me. I'm in Chicago. I have to put it on tape. Um, and and then if it goes after that, then they have to, we have to figure out, you know, travel and all that. So it's a lot more work for whoever is representing me and I'm not there and in their face. So they often forget my now now here is my manager who has less he represents fewer people a manager generally or i think a manager always represents fewer people than an agent at an agency would represent 
And so she's my advocate in my stead, as well as she, she's doing the same thing that they're doing also, trying to get, you know, with her uh, relationships, um, having people consider using me when they would not have considered using me before that. So there's just advocates. Right. And have, they, have you considered advocating on your own behalf by moving to New York or to Los Angeles? Has this been? I spend a lot of time. I had an, uh, for a long time, I had an apartment in Los Angeles for, for a real long time. Um, and I go back and forth and um, I've spent a lot of time in New York as well. Um, I don't like Chicago. And now also one of the reasons that I stayed in Chicago for a long time is that's where I, my bread and butter was for a long time. I did a lot of voiceover work uh, and mostly out of Chicago. So that was bread and butter. Mostly for commercials, the voiceover work? Yes. Because Chicago is a huge ad town. It used to be. Oh, um, <laughs> not and, so much. <laughs> and, and back when I was coming up, it uh, technology was such that post-production you recorded where you were doing your editing. And so their advertising was huge in Chicago. So regardless of where they shot, they came back to Chicago to do post and that's where they needed the voiceover done. There was a whole lot of work being done and not that many of us doing it. And because they were locked in geographically, that's no longer the case. Um, you can, anybody can be anywhere. And so, um, so there's, I don't know where the work, I haven't, I have, I used to do a ton of voiceover work. I haven't had a job in years. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, you could uh, maybe do some podcasts, uh, you know, see if something, something picks up for you. <laughs> you've told me you've got these folks that are, that are advocates on your behalf. Do you do things? I mean, are you active on social media? Are you, uh, do you find that is a way of that you're finding work or that you're no, I've not, promoting I've stuff? Not, I have uh, promoting, yes, uh, like on, uh, that's what I, we were, it was helpful for, but TJ and I also had uh, our own theater for a while and we put up two sketch reviews with the fantastic cast and it was great and uh, we had it for a year and got kicked in the nuts every single day for a full <laughs> year and then turned the keys back over to Sharna Helper and it was her, it was a theater within her building that she uh, gave to us. Um, and we we're so proud of all the uh, shows that were up there and we just could not get people in the seats. Um, and uh, so that was a bummer. Um, but we had, uh, you tried to use social media to, to as a uh, promotion device. Um, and it is helpful. Um, it's not enough on its own, of course, but I, it is helpful as for promotion. I don't do, I've not gotten any work that way. That I know, you know, I'm no, I'm sure of it. I'm not got any work that way. Yeah, fair enough. Neither have I. That's why I'm doing this podcast now. Well, what do you do then to let people know? I mean, I know you do auditions. Let's say I know you certainly meet with people. You've done work for for Amy Sedaris, for example, on multiple occasions. Do you, do you get called back by the same people for different projects? I think yeah. I tend to right. Um, I did a few, I did four different little projects. I, they weren't little projects. My participation in them was small for Harold Ramis. Um, yeah, once I, st I think I don't, and I, that's what I used to do in voiceover as well. I think, and I remember I was just talking to my kid about it yet, uh, yesterday. It's like, why I, I think one of the reasons that I, they kept firing me was I showed up on time and I'm not a total fucking Jagger, you know? And, I, and it's, that puts you head and shoulders. <laughs> <laughs> about most people show up on time prepared and don't be a jagger <laughs> there you go that's a lot of it though uh, there was a guy peter jason who's a fantastic actor who's just a wonderful man as well and i remember him giving some advice uh, about auditioning and he says you, you know you go in, you should be prepared but there's 10 guys outside and all of them are good they're all going to do this material well what you're also trying to do is convince these people across the table that they want to spend two weeks with you, you know? So, uh, so it's, there, it's not merely the, you know, doing the material. Well, that's ground zero. And that's, I believe he's correct that that's, they don't want to hang around with people that are going to be difficult. I mean, they do hang around with people that are difficult for other reasons. You know, I don't bring that. I don't bring guaranteed box office. So they're not going to, up with my nonsense 
<laughs> like they'll put up with nonsense for people who are going to guarantee them money. How are you making this all work? You live in Chicago, you work in New York, you work in LA, you're back to Chicago, you have side projects, you have television, you have film, you have stage. At times you have voiceover and you have a family and you have friends. I'm assuming you have maybe even a hobby or two. How does it all come together? Um, I have a, first of all, uh, I do have, I have two sons that are uh, 28 and 30 now, um, but a great wife um, who did all this. She did all the, she did everything. So maybe I should be interviewing her is what you're yeah, saying. Yeah, really. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and continues to do everything. Um, and then I just run around. And you listed a bunch of different things and a, different, and a bunch of different kinds of things. I do keep busy in total, but I'm not busy in any one of those aspects, really. Altogether, you know, it's, you know, cobbled together a, a career or a living. Um, but in, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of irons in the fire, um, a lot of irons in the fire. And sometimes, you, you know, it, they're, uh, you don't, you don't have anything for a while. And it's nice. Like people say, uh, oh yeah, you don't have to work a regular job. You got all that free time. Um, it's, you know, no, it's just, there's a sense of dread when I, when, you know, if I know a job's coming, yes, it's like vacation. But I never know a job's coming. So it's, it's oh, I'm never going to work again. Even at this point in your career, you still feel that? Yeah, there was a friend of mine uh, who's a fantastic bass player, Graham maybe. And he says, yeah, I used to, uh, when I was working, I used to get nervous because I go, I know this is going to be, uh, as soon as I stop working, I think oh, I'm never going to work again. And he goes, and now, even when I'm working, I think, oh, this is going to end and I'm never going to work again. So, it, no, yeah, it's still there. And I think that's part of it. This, you know, that I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I just have to learn to live with it um, because that's what, oh, I got to keep on it. Otherwise, I do, you do have to keep on it. I know a lot of people that just hang around and wait for the phone to ring. Um, that, that does not sound like a good time. I can't do that. I'll go bat you. So you're actually using this for a, a sense of motivation, really. Yes, right. Yeah, that's definitely better than going batshit crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. Better busy than bored. Motivation or uh, fuel to um, to punish myself. <laughs> you can always take up golf. Oh no, that's unfortunately that's one thing I can never do. I was a caddy as a kid, and uh, I developed an aversion to both golf and golfers. <laughs> I think that's just fine. Let's be fair. That kind of dicks. Kind of. So what kind of advice might you have for somebody who wants to get into the improv game, wants to get on stage, wants to get in front of the camera? Do it. Um, and, I, and I think uh, especially when you just do it and do it a lot. Um, well, also one of the things is know what it is, your interest, you know, what you want to do. Um, because, and it's fine without any judgment too. What do you want to do? Um, and then go about pursuing that because, and it changes. And it ha I know it has for me. Sometimes what I want is to just get better on stage. And there's a great place to do that. And that is on stage. Take any jobs, get on stage. Um, and get better. Um, there is no better teacher than a paying audience. Uh, class is good, workshops are good, but there's no better place to learn than on stage in front of a paying audience of strangers. Um, and so, if that's the goal, that's the way to go about doing it. But if the goal is what I really want to, I want to be on TV. Okay, I want to be on TV, but I'm doing theater in these storefronts, that's a recipe for a lot of resentment for everyone um, because it, it can't possibly give you what it is you want. And so you're going to hate it and the people around you are going to sense it and it's just going to be unpleasant for everyone. So honestly, without judgment, what is it I want? And then go about achieving that or take steps towards that. Rather. And then that changes, even on the way to it. It has for me anyway. Oh, I'd like to do this thing. And on the way to it, oh, you know what? I don't want that thing that I really wanted. I'm going to, I want this now. I'll always be aware of that. Just, and also 
nothing wrong with any of those desires. Like, do you ever find that you've taken on a project and you think, oh, this is just a waste of time? Or do they all have some merit? Do you tend to find something worthwhile in, in almost everything you do? Or are some of them just absolute dogs? Yeah, there's a friend of mine, John Judd, who I came up with at, in Dell's workshops. And he's a act, great actor in Chicago. And he, he says, when it's really bad, well, do I want the job or do I want the story, right? And um, sometimes I want the job right? I need the paycheck or something. Sometimes I want the story. So I'm going to go out in a blaze of glory. Um, and so I do think that there's something, it's rare that I take something that I don't know. There's something about it that I want. And it's either I want, and I want money. I want uh, to work with these people. I want to do this particular material. I want to try this thing I've never done before. So it has to have at least one of those factors in it before I'll do it. Um, and it's, when I'm first getting going, I, what I want is experience. And I want, you know, if, and if there's money involved, that's, that's absolutely fantastic. So there's always something in it that I, I know I want. Um, sometimes it's a drag and I have to remind myself, oh, I'm not here for friendships or do great material. I'm here because I want this credit or I, I need that money or something. I want to do it as well as I can. Yeah, I think there's always something valuable in it. And I had some great advice. I was working construction and this um, Italian immigrant who I was working with, he was, he was, there was a lot of older guys that were from Italy. He was younger. He was not much older than me, like maybe 10 years older than me. I was probably 18 at the time. He, yeah, I was, he was probably 10 years older than me. And he's like, well, what do you want to do? And this is before I'd ever done anything. I'd never been on stage never tried anything. He said, what do you want to do? And I just like, I don't think I'd ever told anyone this, but him. I said, I kind of, I think I maybe want to try comedy. And I don't, I don't, I honestly don't think I'd ever told anyone that before him. And he said, well, you got to try. Otherwise you'll always wonder. And I, I think that is absolutely clearly it made an impact because I'm still remembering it today. And it was just a, you know, just an offhanded comment from this guy, uh, driving along in a pickup truck. Um, and I, I, I think that's great advice. You got, you got to try, otherwise you always wonder. And then you don't have to wonder anymore. Like, oh, fuck, I hate this. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't, I don't know what I was thinking. This is not anything that's appealing to me. But for me, it was in, improvisation. And I walked into that first class and really almost from the beginning, I, I just really enjoyed it. Judy Morgan was my teacher. She, was, she made it real easy to like it. What do you think you might have done if you were, well, if you didn't love it, or for that matter, if you were terrible at it? Well, I was, uh, I was in at the, I mean, it, when I finished college, I was doing commercial real estate, uh, purchasing and managing small commercial properties, like little strip malls and stuff like that for this small investment group. Um, and it was, a, that was one of those times, like, it was a great, great job. It was a great job. I had a bunch of money that they gave me the, you know, this responsibility to go out and purchase places and manage the properties that they had. And um, a lot of freedom and a lot of responsibility kind of by myself. And I was thinking, God damn, this is a great job for someone who wants it. <laughs> like, cause I honestly, I couldn't imagine getting a better job than this right out of college. I'm like, uh, this is not, this is not for me. And so I quit everything and started, I lived on my buddy's floor and Started doing stand up and improvisation. David, where can people find out more about you? Uh, DavidPasquazy.com. Also, TJ and I wrote a book about improvisation and the way we look at it um, called Improvisation at the Speed of Life. And uh, it's just the way we look at, look at improv improvising the way we improvise it. <laughs> You're downplaying it. But Stephen Colbert basically says you guys are the best improvisers. What was the quote? I think I, I got this quote. Hang on for a second. I'm finding this. I think he basically said one of these guys is the best improviser on earth and the other guy is better than him. Yeah. What does he know? Um, <laughs> and uh, also for absolute free, you can watch the graveyard show and distant learners. And if there's some TJ and Dave shows on Vimeo and uh, if you want to watch those, there's a, a documentary uh, called trust us. This is all made up. What else? Uh, I'm on at home with Amy Sedaris. 
It's a hoot. Yeah, Tony Punyalata. Tony the Knife Guy. <laughs> Tony the Knife Guy. <laughs> well, thank you so much for being on the show and sharing with us how you make a living. Thanks for having me. Subscribe to Making a Living Show on Apple, Google, Spotify, Stitcher, and pretty much anywhere else you get your podcasts. For more on the show, visit makingalivingshow.com and follow along on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. Making a Living Show is produced by Next Exit Media and hosted by me, Roby Levy. Thanks for listening.